completely destroying liberty. Now before we go into the grievances of James, let me ask this question. Of the 600 years that we have now covered in history, how many are you seeing that history repeating today? Would you say that that history is repeating with great precision? Yes. You see, I'm not here to teach you opinions. I'm here to teach you history and facts. Because the facts and the history speak for themselves. We did not invent anything, and I just want to show you one more thing. They said that James was completely destroying liberty by writing law, overturning law, and setting aside law when that was a power reserved to Parliament alone. We did not invent separation of powers. They had separation of powers in 1688. They had an executive branch in the king, they had a legislative branch in Parliament, and they had a judicial branch. And they understood that separation of powers was necessary to, to, to maintain liberty. Separation of powers means that power cannot be shared across the branches, and it cannot be stolen. And they said, when the executive branch is writing law, overturning law, and setting aside law, when that is a power reserved to the legislative branch alone, the only result can ever be the complete destruction of liberty. How is it that a people of 1688 with no cell phones, no Google Oracle, no CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, knew that executive orders were the complete destruction of liberty, and today, America does nothing. Because we've become universally ignorant about our history and where we came from. So we've been brainwashed into believing that the Constitution is too complicated for the peasants to understand. I watched this congressional dog and pony with FBI Director Corm Comey. Because you know it's just dog and pony. All it is is political grandstanding so they can get their sound bites so they can get reelected as champions. They're never going to do anything. Connolly, Representative Connolly said before the entire hearing and the entire world that he was outraged that the people were reading federal statutes and questioning government. He said when the people can sit around and read federal statutes and question the government, the people have too much time on their hands. Welcome to the aristocracy. The peasants and the peons have no business telling us what to do. And they're too stupid to know anyway. The problem is we're not stupid. We're just ignorant. We've been denied the essential information necessary to remain a constitutional republic where the people govern government. So now we have this history. And we can understand that George III did not invent tyranny. And Thomas Jefferson did not invent liberty. Because you see, George III was just engaging in the same malignant and pernicious design. Our battle for independence was not over a 3% sales tax on tea. As a matter of fact, by the time we actually went to blows, the 3% had actually been reduced to almost less, well, less than 1.5%. The truth of our independence from Great Britain was because the government was passing laws but refusing to allow the colonists to have representation in Parliament. The colonists are saying these laws you keep passing on us are being done without our representation in Parliament. So don't be silly. Of course you have representation. We have people over here in Parliament who have volunteered to represent your interests. 
The colonists said, seriously? If they're over there on the island creating laws to be enforced on us in this continent, and they never have to come over here and live under those laws, they don't represent us. See, that's a little history lesson we do well to learn. That when the people who make the laws are not subject to those laws, they do not represent you. They represent themselves and their own special interests. So part of these laws that they were writing were yes taxes because Great Britain had to recoup a debt from the French and Indian War. And they wanted to make sure that they could get this money quickly. So they imposed um, consumption taxes. Everybody knows what that is, right? Sales taxes, right? On linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink. They wanted to make sure they got these taxes so the people couldn't avoid paying taxes. Now, of those taxes, linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink, what do you think was the most offensive tax to our American colonists? Paper and ink. And not because of freedom of press or freedom of speech. You see, they believed that they had a right to due process. A right means you don't have to ask permission. And they said, when we have to pay a tax on paper and ink, that means we have to pay the government before we can engage in our rights to due process. We have to have paper and ink to file court documents. And if we have to pay the government before we can exercise our right to due process, that is despotism. Sort of puts a whole new light on filing fees, doesn't it? Well, Parliament got a brilliant idea because they're not collecting these taxes quick enough. We can maximize our revenue from these consumption taxes, linen, lumber, sugar, tea, paper, and ink, by mandating that the colonists purchase the taxed items. We will then issue writs of assistance, which are warrantless searches to search their homes and their businesses to ensure that they're buying the mandated items. And if they're refusing to buy the mandated items, we will arrest them, we will put them on a boat, and we will transport them to Canada to be tried for their crimes. Quebec, specifically, and to Great Britain as well. But why Quebec? Well, Quebec was a British colony, technically, of their peers. Here's the problem. Quebec had successfully petitioned Parliament to retain French law in their borders. And French laws do not give you a right to a trial by a jury of your peers. That is something that was unique to British law. So why did we go to war with our own country? Why was it a civil war? Not tea. Legislation without representation. Mandated purchases warrantless searches, denial of due process, and being subject to foreign courts and foreign laws. Go read the Declaration of Independence again. You, you will see you have to get to the 17th grievance before they even mention taxes. And so here we are. What do we do? Patrick Henry says, what do we want? What do we ask for? What are we going to do with this new government? How many of you remember from your history lessons that there were people begging George Washington to be king? We were this close to being the kingdom of America. Thank God we had some framers who said, whoa, wait a minute. We've been doing the kingdom thing for the last 700 years and it doesn't work out so well. See, kings only keep their promises as long as you hold a sword at their throat. The minute you drop the sword, kings go back to being kings and people go back to being subjects. And by the way, when you want to control your government in the kingdom, your only option is the sword. We want something better for our posterity. We want to preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, not doom our future to war. Kingdoms require wars. Let's do a constitutional republic instead, where the people can control their government without the sword. Here's 
the problem. We are now in a state of confusion on what to do about the federal government. I ask people, do you think the federal government's out of control? The answer is always yes. Do you know what the next most asked question I get is? What do we do about it? If we've been teaching the Constitution properly for the last hundred years, we would know what to do about it because the solutions are Those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Because history always repeats. But if you don't know where the potholes are, you're going to keep falling in. That's why this is so important. That's why I teach so much. How many of you can think of at least three people who should have been sitting here with you right now? Well, guess what? They are. Because you are now recruited to teach this to them. I'm coming back in September, which is actually kind of a miracle in and of itself, because I literally book a year in advance. Because, well, because I teach for free. I have no speaking fees. I don't make any group compensate me for my travel or my expenses. I am not independently wealthy. And in spite of the rumors, I have no funding from the Koch brothers. <laughs> and I will not accept a government grant. And I am not a 501c3 because I will not allow the government to tell me what I can and cannot say. But we do operate by faith. See, I am a Christian. And I believe that liberty is a gift from God. And I believe that God expects us to defend the gifts that he's given us. And I also believe that when we stand in defense of his gifts, he stands with us. I have a father who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I am a child of a king. There are no riches outside my reach. And for six years now, we have traveled over 22 states every single year, teaching over 265 times. And we are not bankrupt. And we have not missed a house payment. And God keeps us on the road. I don't tell you that to lift myself up. I tell you that if you rely on this author of liberty, he will provide for you. We have people who donate to us monthly, like missionaries. I had one group tag me that is Chris Ann Hall is a missionary to the people of the United States in defense of the Constitution. And I think that's awesome. We have these meetings because you ask us here. Anybody here have students in high school or middle school? I teach your schools with no speaking fees. How many of you have church groups? I have a religious liberty lesson that I teach in churches, and we even read from the Bible. 
I know that's heresy in some churches today, but sorry. <laughs> I'm coming back in September. Why don't you get with the people and say, hey, we got a church. Can Christiane come and teach our church? How many here, how many of you have a sheriff? How many of you have a county commissioner? How many of you have a city councilman? I mean, everybody should be raising their hand, right? How many of you have a state legislator? A governor? An attorney general? These are the people that I teach. I'm going to be teaching tomorrow in Ridge. How many of you would like to know the solutions to getting the federal government back under control? Come see us tomorrow in Ridge, because that's what I'm going to be teaching. Not my opinion, but the plan that our framers put in place. This is the lesson that I teach your state legislators, by the way. I have taught the state legislators of uh, Arizona, Kansas, I'm starting to lose track now, I can't remember it now. Arizona, Kansas, Missouri, Idaho, uh, somewhere else, and Oregon. <laughs> yes, I taught the legislators in Oregon about the Constitution. Now I'm thinking if I can teach in Oregon, I should be able to teach here in New Hampshire, right? Because the only place worse than Oregon is California. <laughs> And I haven't been there yet either. If our people don't know what they're supposed to be doing in our capitals, how are they going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing? I have a class that uh, educates law enforcement that's been approved by the state of Texas and the state of Alaska as continuing credit hours, educational credit hours for their deputies. And I can come and teach your police chiefs and your sheriff and their deputies as well. And guess what? It won't cost you a dime. But what's it costing our children to remain ignorant? All right, so let me tell you what I got over here. How many of you are going to remember everything that you learned today about the history lesson I just taught you? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you realize we're not teaching this to our children in the schools? Not even in the private schools. That's why I've written these two books. These two books teach the history that I just taught you. This blue one is for non-readers. It's thinner, it's colorful, and it has a learning tool. Every single chapter has a poem in it. So when your non-reader memorizes the poem, they've learned the principle they're supposed to learn in that chapter. I have parents who have told me that their three and four-year-olds have memorized every single poem in this book, so it's not complicated. I have this book, which is the full manuscript for independent readers. How many of you can read? I'm just teasing, right? I say this because everybody looks at it and says, oh, this is for high school kids. No, this is for anybody who did not get this. I have, I, I have adults who buy this for themselves. I am convinced they're not getting it for kids, <coughs> okay? And even if they are, they're gonna read it first. This, is, this book teaches us the history that I just taught, the five documents, and then it has chapters on founders and framers that you don't get to hear about anywhere else. For example, Give me the name of the first man to give his life in our movement of independence from Great Britain. Christmas, Christmas Addicts. Crispus Addicts. Very good. Crispus Addicts was a freed slave who had become a whaler for the merchant marines. Very rarely do I have somebody in the groups that knows his name. Crispus Addicts. A uh, ship was docked at the Boston port, and he heard an alarm go off on his ship. Now he ran up deck to put out a fire, because that's usually what an alarm on a ship means. Only to find out that there was no fire, but that his own government had picked up arms against his own people. This is about to, we're about to experience the Boston Massacre. Crispus Attucks ran back below deck, got 55 of his shipmates, and came out and gave his life for us. Listen to this poem about Christmas Addict. Actually, it was a whole poem about the Boston Massacre, but this is the Christmas Addict section. Honor to Christmas Addict, who was leader and voice that day. 
The first to defy and the first to die with maverick car and gray. Call it riots or revolution, his pan first clenched at the crown. His feet were the first in perilous place to pull the king's flag down. His breast was the first one rent apart that liberty's stream might flow. For our freedom now and forever, his head was first laid low. Call it riot or revolution or mob or crowd as you may. Such deaths have been seed of nations. Such lives shall be honored for a. The Boston Globe did an article on, on uh, Crispus Attic's funeral procession. They said it was the most attended funeral they'd ever seen. Over 10,000 people came to honor him. And we don't even know his name. There were battalions of freed slaves that fought for our independence. There were provisions within the states that said, if you are a slave and you want to fight for liberty, you are now a free man forever. Do you know what that means, though? There are some people who gave their only free breath so that we could have liberty, and we don't even know who they are. Because it doesn't fit the progressive objective of demonizing the Constitution. I think that is disgraceful. So I go about teaching our children something different. Remember your pop quiz? <laughs> Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, the right to peaceably assemble, and the right to petition the government for a redress of your grievances. Liberty first, the path to restoring America. Constitutional activism 101. How do you use and exercise the liberties identified in your First Amendment to secure the liberty of your children? This is a how-to book on exercising the First Amendment. The class that I am teaching tomorrow comes from this book, Sovereign Duty. This book is the plan that our framers put in our hands to control the federal government when it gets out of control. How many of you saw the history of 700 years repeating today? How many of you believe that our framers knew that history? So why wouldn't they know as well that there was a danger that the government would get out of control? They did. They anticipated it. What did the lady say to Benjamin Franklin? Mr. Franklin, what kind of government did you give us? How did Franklin respond? A republic if you can keep it. They knew that republics, although the only government that can actually preserve liberty for the future, was a very delicate and precarious style of government. But requires the vigilance, the daily vigilance of the people. And when we become pacified in prosperity, lazy in luxury, <coughs> we become complacent and compliant in our comfort, government gets out of its cage. Our framers wrote down exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And this book teaches that lesson. Also has a chapter on your constitutional sheriff. The history of the sheriff from the Shire Reeves to the sheriffs today. It has a chapter on your right to keep and bear arms. It has a chapter on your right to be secure in your person's house's papers and affect your property. It has a chapter on, an article, on the Article 5 Convention. Asking questions and teaching things that nobody else wants to talk about. Not only that, Every quote and every document used in this book is cited in the back to its original source text. I'm an original source historian. I do not read other people's history books. I read the documents myself, and I want to put them in your hands. I don't want you to believe anything that I tell you. And I don't want anybody to look back on me and say, Chrisanne was cherry-picking. She was misapplying or misconstruing. I am so confident of the information that I have for you that I'm giving you my sources so you can test me. I teach 
a five-hour workshop on Saturdays. Am I coming back to teach a workshop in September? Okay. In this workshop, I teach this history, and then I walk through the Bill of Rights, 1 through 10. I show you where they came from, what they mean, how they're supposed to be applied, what we're doing wrong. We admit we're doing things wrong, right? <laughs> and then the solutions for making them right. This is not a bait and switch. I don't charge you for those either. All you have to do is promise me that you will give me six hours, and I will teach you this material. Now, I have over here a three DVD set of a workshop that I taught in Orlando. Now, we took more time to teach this because I knew it was being recorded, so there is almost six hours of teaching on this, and there's bonus material that I don't teach in my classes. And it's chaptered out in sections, so you don't have to watch all six hours at one time. There are three DVDs in each set, and we have these available to you. We offer a special package deal for the, this book and the DVD set because the book picks up where the DVD set leaves off. So uh, the DVD set, we ask $30 for it. The book, we ask $15. You buy them together, it's $40. We also have a package deal for the entire set. All four books and the DVDs is just $70. And we have t-shirts that are available for $15. Why would I have t-shirts? because you have just now been recruited. <laughs> you see, I want to give you the opportunity to teach what you've learned. And I recognize a matter of human nature, we're shy. So I want to give you the ability to work, right? Somebody says, wow, that's interesting. What does that mean? Glad you asked. And it opens the door. Every single person in this room should go home and write a 30-second elevator speech about some aspect of liberty that you're passionate about. Just 30 seconds is all you need. I do it all the time. Wow, can you believe what's going on in America today? Have I identified whether I'm conservative or liberal? No, but their answer will. And based on their answer, now I know how to reach them with truth. If we are not exercising our speech, we are failing to teach. And we're only ensuring that the status quo will remain. So I have recruited you to be boots on the ground, defense of liberty. Because guess what? If you don't leave here changed, I just spoke to an empty room. We all now have a responsibility. You have three people you have to go tell this truth to. Help us out in any way you can to stay on the road. One of the ways you can help us is get us meetings in September when we come back. Find meetings for us in the future. Bring friends to my meeting tomorrow. Come tomorrow and bring a friend. What are the dates for the meetings? You want to? 7th and 8th. 7th and 8th. September is my birthday month. We can have a mutually beneficial relationship. You can take home the resources, and then I can make a little bit of money to get to the next meeting. That's how this works. So, above and beyond all of that other stuff, can I ask you to please pray for us? This is exciting, it is fun, it is rewarding, but it's very taxing on the family. Not only that, my husband is about to go off to Haiti. We are also missionaries to Haiti. When we're not in the United States teaching the Constitution, we're missionaries for Christ in Haiti. And we're going to be separated for about three weeks. So uh, please pray for my son, who's going to be without his daddy, and me, who will be out of my way for my husband for that time. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for bringing me in. Thank you to the VFW for giving us this beautiful location. And thank you for your time and love of liberty.
applies for Rich and for Sheriff over here on this table. Thank you so much for coming. I want to do this again on September 7th.